Hello, and thank you for joining our Introduction to Design Thinking webinar series. My name is Keith Keating, and I'm a Design Thinking Practitioner with GP Strategies. In this eight-part webinar series, we will be sharing the theory of design thinking from a high-level overview through each of the five phases and finishing with suggestions for ways to continue learning on your journey to becoming a design thinking practitioner. In this session, I will be sharing with you an overview on the second phase of the design thinking methodology, DEFINE. Now, before we start talking about the DEFINE phase, as a quick reminder, the five phases of design thinking are empathy, define, ideate, prototype, and test. Empathy, where we first learn about our audience. We then take that information and then we define the problem statement based on what we've learned. And then we move into ideation, where we create, brainstorm, and come up with as many ideas as we can based on the problem statements that we've identified. Then we build representations of one or more of those ideas, quick representations. And then, of course, we test those ideas with our users to gain their feedback. With that, Let's talk about the define phase, where we define the problem statements. And so in the define phase here, we're looking to analyze the data that we've just uncovered through our empathy research to help reveal the user's needs and insights. And so there are three activities that happen. One, we unpack our empathy findings. We then use our empathy findings to help scope a meaningful problem or need statement. And then we help to develop a point of view for the user based on what we've learned about them. Now, in the defined phase, the first step typically is you brain dump. You start to put down all of the ideas that you had, all of the themes that you may have heard, all of the key points. And then you go through data synthesis and coding to create themes around what the user has told you so that you can uncover themes and messaging related to what their needs and what their challenges are. Now, there's a couple of tools that help you in the defined phase. First, to help clarify your point of view, one tool that we tend to use in design thinking is how might we. Rather than just using a blanket problem statement, we turn that problem statement into a how might we question. And the reason that we do that is because when you reframe a problem, as a how might we question. It makes it meaningful and actionable, and it helps to drive your design. Now, there is a specific reason why we use the three words, how might we. How suggests that we do not yet have the answer. It helps us set aside our prescriptive beliefs, and how helps us to explore that there are a variety of different ways that we may be able to solve this. Now, might, emphasizes that our responses may only be possible solutions, not the only solution. And might also allows for us to explore other solutions, not settling for the first that comes to mind. And we. We immediately brings in the element of a collaborative effort. We suggests that the idea for the solution lies in our collective teamwork. How might we? Now, another tool that we use is the empathy or four box. And that is where you record your insights and you pinpoint the needs based on your users. And you use this for each one of the interviews that you had. And in the four box, although it's very customizable, it tends to capture what they said. So actual quotes from them, what they talked about, what they did, what they thought and what they felt. So you've got your four box tools and typically you use that for each of the interviews that you had. And this helps again to distill down the information that you're uncovering in the research. And so here's an example of a four box in action. And in this case, the four boxes were, who am I? What are my motivations and goals? What are some key quotes? And what are some friction points in my job? Now, another tool or best practice is, of course, writing the need statements. So typically, when you have your four boxes, you have your empathy research, you're going to have a lot of statements from your research. And so now what you need to do is turn those user statements into actual needs statements. And so there's a couple of best practices. First of all, you want to be specific about what that actual need is. You want to be using positive statements 
instead of negative statements. You want to describe an attribute of the product, process, or experience that the user is defining or discussing. You want to avoid the words must and should because those are declarative statements. And again, we're not saying that these are exactly what needs to be solved, but we are coming up with a general idea or an approach. And so you want to avoid must and should. An example of writing needs statements from the user need to the actual need statement to the how might we question. So here's an example. Let's say that you have been conducting empathy research and the user statement was, I work in the field and I don't have a computer or office. My routine changes day to day. That's the user statement. So we can turn that into a needs statement. The user needs the ability to access information in that moment of need. Now, technically, you could stop right there with the need statement. But in design thinking, we like to evolve to a how might we question so that it makes it more meaningful and actionable. In this case, the how might we question could be how might we provide learning in the moment of need? And so if you compare the need statement to the how might we question, you'll see that it is more meaningful. It does seem to be more actionable. Another example, I don't learn by watching an online course. I learn by doing it myself. That was the statement from the user. So the needs statement could be, the user needs to learn from experience. Now we can evolve that into the how might we question. How might we give learners experiential ways to learn on their own? And you may even turn statements into more than one how might we question. But again, the how might we question is then what we move forward with in terms of the ideation and the prototyping. Another tool that we can use in design thinking in the define phase are user personas. User personas are a fictitious character that represents the different type of users of a service or a product. Sometimes it could be by role, so customer service agent, HR representative, bank teller, or it could be by tenure. So in a user persona, it's created from the data from the empathy research, either your interviews or your observations, and it helps you to imagine the various different types of needs that each user might have. And of course, it can also be inspired and built from real customers. Now, you can create user personas if you don't have access to the individual users themselves, maybe other people in your organization have experience with those users. So you can then practice empathy, you can put yourself in their shoes, and you can even create user personas when you don't have access directly to the users, just so that you can gather different insights and get other points of view so that you can create an amalgamated version of what represents that user so that you have a vision in mind of who you're trying to solve the problem for. At the end of the day, that's one of the most valuable outputs of user personas is getting a look at who that user is and making sure that everybody in the design thinking project has that same model of that user in their mind. That's where the user persona becomes very powerful. Here's an example of a user persona worksheet that you can use to create a user persona. In this case, we're estimating their age or their gender. We're identifying their role. What's their work environment like? What are quotes that they said or may have said if you don't have direct access to the users? What are their thoughts? What's something that they would say? Well, how about do they use devices or technologies? What about their personal life, their education? Again, you're just creating a big picture of what this user represents or what represents them. So here's an example of a user persona in practice. And so this was for a customer service representative in a call center. And we named her Sarah Burns, but Sarah does not exist. This is again an amalgamation of a number of interviews across the customer service representative call center role that helps to create a picture of what this general role looks like. This concludes our session on the define phase. So thank you for joining us and please make sure to check out our next session on the ideate phase.
Don't forget to check out the rest of the Design Thinking site as well. And make sure to use the contact form on the Design Thinking site to reach out to us or simply add me on LinkedIn to continue the Design Thinking conversation. Thank you for joining.